Yes, but uh, so uh, I don't know. I was here all day yesterday, almost in all the talks, and uh, it's supposed to be a conference on algorithms and low bounds. But I think there was no talk directly aimed at the uh, connections between algorithms and low bounds. So maybe there'll be subsequent uh, <laughs> talks. Uh, uh, when I talked to the organizers, they asked me to give some general. Uh, something general about this connection between low bounds and uh, algorithms. And I started preparing this kind of uh, talk, but uh, then, as usual, you know, you are much more excited about what you are doing currently. So that's what I re will really tell you about. And just to uh, pay my dues to the organizers and my promise, I'll do five minutes flash of connections of algorithms and low bounds. <laughs> And I think actually this may be a good uh, thing to elaborate on in, uh, in uh, you know, the panel tomorrow or something like that. But anyway, so don't expect to get anything from that. Uh, okay, the main thing I learned about the connection between algorithms and low bounds I learned as a postdoc, and this is this message. You cannot. <laughs> Move higher or lower bounds than what your algorithms uh, do. That's how Barrington discovered his famous theorem. He was trying to prove low bounds on constant width branching programs for majority, and he discovered that they can do all of NC1. So that's the main, that you have to remember this. But this is a great connection, right? Because when you're working on one, you're working on the other. Uh, there are lots of connections. I wrote down a few in both directions. You know, some algorithms that give lower bounds and lower bounds that give algorithms. And sometimes it goes both ways. Uh, so I'll just flash them. You know all of them. Turing's diagonalization is a prime example, uh, and diagonalization in general, of how you use an algorithm in order to prove lower bounds. Uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, you know we are not satisfied with, right? We, we know that P is sandwiched between L and P space. But if we have, we have a log space algorithm for P, then we separated it for P space. But sometimes you can push it farther than this trivial uh, one, and the, even non-uniform algorithms can imply uniform separations. This is the result uh, with uh, uh, Valentin and Russell. Uh, you have uh, circuit simulations of uh, non-deterministic exponential time proves uh, actually a uh, uh, uniform separation. Of course, it's actually by reduction to a trivial thing like that. Um, you prove that this. <clears throat> uniform upper bound is a uniform a non-uniform algorithm implies a uniform algorithm, which is the heart of the matter. Actually, I saw that Ryan Williams in his survey on algorithms and lower bounds recommends that you read this proof. So I would join his recommendation. It's really weird uh, that there is this equivalence. Anyway, uh, the approximation method is yet a very different way in which algorithms imply lower bounds, but as Bohr's message uh, to us uh, about monotone circuits or SC02 circuits, is that you, you have a weak model. What you try to do is actually approximate the function is computed, but by a much, much weaker model. Much, much weaker. And for this very weak model, you prove your lower bounds trivially. Similar things happen, of course, with random restrictions and so on. Uh, Ryan Williams took this idea, pushed it way uh, farther. How you use algorithms to on weak models to prove lower bounds, and of course we have the amazing uh, connection uh, of uh, Valentin and Russell that uh, uh, polynomial identity test some you know very basic derandomization task algorithm gives us lower bounds. And they go in the other way also, uh, although fewer, I think. Uh, we have all the derandomization uh, results. You have a hard function. I remember I was a graduate student when this happened, and it totally blew my mind that you can. Maybe that's the first really real example. You take a lower bound for something, and you get an upper bound for something else, a deterministic algorithm for some problem. Uh, there are more sophisticated examples, uh, even uh, you know, very recent. Uh, there is this uh, beautiful lower bound of Cole and Rath separating information complexity and communication complexity. What algorithm does it give? It shows that there is no direct sum in communication complexity. 
This means it's an algorithm. It's an algorithm that uh, achieves economy of scale. You can, save ma you can compute many independent copies of a function much faster than their number times uh, one. So it's a very uh, indirect, beautiful algorithmic consequence of a low bound. We uh, are compression. And of course, there are natural proofs. So, you know, it's, uh, <coughs> low bound proofs that we know of seem to produce algorithms. It's a psychological statement. We cannot prove low bound without as a byproduct produce algorithm. Okay, so I'll leave you that. There's lots of things to discuss and find generalizations of this and so on. I want to talk about something else. Uh, I want to talk about uh, attempts to find lower bounds, particularly non-commutative lower bounds. Uh, we didn't get there. We got to some uh, polynomial identity test in the non-commutative uh, regime. But the real story is uh, not about the result, which I think is, is very interesting, but actually about these connections between so many fields. So this problem, the particular uh, non-commutative uh, identity test I'll talk about, connects all these things, connects them non-trivially. Many people have worked in these different fields, have worked on this problem for their own reasons, often unaware of various progresses in, in others. And uh, I want to tell you about some of this. Uh, so this is a thing that we learned over the past three years. Uh, one work with uh, Pavel and what I want to tell you about today, work with uh, two students in uh, Berkeley, and Pete Garg and uh, Rafael Oliveira. So how, uh, you know, how do I demonstrate this? Uh, I can give you some of the references that go into this picture. And I color coded them so you'll see algorithms, uh, you'll see lower bounds, you'll see non commutative algebra, you'll see uh, algebraic geometry and invariant theory, and you'll see some quantum information theory here. So I'll, uh, I'll skip this, you don't have to remember it. <laughs> um, what is this? Oh, these are the connections. Okay, so I will tell you about the connection. It took me two days to generate this picture. But I didn't think that, ah, I see. I thought it will also. So this is a journey. OK, so these are the things I want to tell you about. Uh, to remember step by step. Yeah, so there are 20 steps here, <laughs> Yeah, which eventually I uh, get here. So actually, if I, I need the board, so maybe you can switch this off. So it took me. Really, two days to lay out these things so to minimize edge lengths and crossings. <laughs> it's the, it was the hardest thing. So, uh, <coughs> let me start. Of course, I I want to have this is a two-hour talk. So, and I don't have two hours unless Boaz the. <laughs> I'll tell you about some of the things, and uh, we'll see. The rest uh, you can ask me separately, or if we write the. This is work in progress, so uh, if we write the, finish writing the paper, I hope to do some decent survey of these connections. There are several ways to uh, approach this, and uh, uh, one is uh, you have a question. Uh, one is uh, sort of about uh, sacred cows and uh, I don't know slaughtering sacred cows. Uh, so who who invented the, the standard you know polynomial de determinant you know uh, identity testing you know, symbolic determinant? Let me write it down so we. You know, so you have a, a matrix, I'll call it L, of uh, you know, Lij of variables, some variables, let's say it's an n by n matrix. Variables, you can might as well there'll be n variables. It 
doesn't matter the arithmetic n squared n will be up to polynomial in n. So you want to know whether <coughs> so it must be girls. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, in this uh, in this form, find an algorithm for this problem. It's Edmond since '67. And uh, actually, maybe I should start writing down some of the fields we are going to talk about. So. The algorithms, and uh, this will include some, uh, you know, of, of course, optimization, and even Metroid theory and linear algebra. Um, complexity by complexity, I mean uh, some of the fields I want to connect. By complexity, of course, there'll be lower bounds, and the randomization, and completeness will be very important. And uh, then I want to talk about some of the non-commutative algebra. Very difficult uh, algebra. If you just write ALG, ALG it, it looks like algorithm. And determinant and deterministic, you cannot shorten to death. It's a real problem. Uh, so here mainly the theory of uh, skew fields. And uh, also, what determinant means. Uh, and I want to talk about invariant theory, maybe invariant theory, and this, you know, maybe algebraic geometry. And uh, yeah, representation theory and stuff like that. Um, and I said I'll talk about quantum. Theory. And there are other fields there which I will not get to. Ah, so that's, uh, it's very interesting. You don't see the boxes. I was sure that we will see all the boxes. Do you see all the boxes? Yeah? Ah, okay. Well, I'm not sure you have to look in the boxes, but uh, I think here you can see me <laughs> pretty well. Um, okay, actually, uh, people here prefer to see the board on this. Uh, do you like the board projected there? There's also the recording of the videos, so maybe yeah. they want to include Well, that. actually, I mean, it, if you, yeah, why don't you put the board on, the, on all of them? I guess people on the sides can. Okay, so, uh, the, the way this uh, square, the story, uh, uh, goes is that, uh, you know, it all starts with bipartite matching. We have this uh, bipartite matching that Edmonds was interested in. And uh, he invented this. He asked this question as a, some kind of linear algebraic generalization of bipartite matching. And uh, at the time, he was not uh, aware of this, but about a decade later, uh, so he suggested a symbolic determinant for solving matching, as you, many of you, or all of you know. And about a decade later, uh, Lovas noted that uh, this can be solved in BPP. So that's a basic thing that we know, or in RP. So it's efficient, and uh, this derandomization problem became uh, extremely important. It was a particular derandomization problem, and it became very important for two reasons. One is that uh, it looked like something about determinants, but uh, over here, valiants work. Valiants work on the completeness of uh, determinant for VP, and later we'll talk about permanent for VNP. So this result made it, you know, a general polynomial identity test. And uh, Cabanet in Pagliazzo made, you know, showed that this derandomization problem is sort of universal. If you derandomize it, you get lower bounds. So I want to talk about this uh, 
a non-commutative analog of this problem. And for that, you know, you have to try to understand what's a non-commutative, what should be a non-commutative analog of this problem. So let me maybe write a, separate the board here to commutative and non-commutative. So we said that this is a question of whether the determinant of L is identically zero. So, well, we can ask about determinant, but there are lots of determinants in the, in the non-commutative world. So the question may be which determinant to choose. Uh, that's one problem. We can look at other equivalent versions of this question. You can ask whether this matrix is invertible, right? That's a question here. So is L invertible? So over what? Invertible well. Sorry, are you all asleep? It's <laughs> <laughs> so over the over the rational field, right? Over the field of rational functions in these variables. That's a question. So you can ask if it's invertible here, but uh, over which? Is so you I might what? Isn't that the same as asking if the determinant is zero? No, here in the non-commutative, it's not. In the, non, in the commutative. Yeah, so these are all equivalent. Oh, these are all equivalent ways, and then you wonder what's a non-commutative analog. Okay. So it's not clear where you are trying to invert this matrix if you are non-commutative. We'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah, these are all equivalent. Well, you can ask if L can be factorized as, uh, I don't know, K times M, where... What did you write? I don't, you know, over which, over what? You may want to invert it, but the question is over what? Um, you know, we can uh, try to just factor L into narrow, you know, into narrow matrices. That's a question. Again, it's equivalent. Just try to, and you can, you have to ask over what, and again, over whatever field we are working on. By the way, you mean not invertible, right? Yeah, so it's this. Yeah. yeah. Are they? Are they? You know, is it? Yeah. Yeah, equivalent up to sign. Very good. Yeah. So there is some field in the background here. And of course, this problem is in BPP only if the field is large. It's NP hard otherwise. But we are talking about large fields. So again, you can try to factor it here, and you can ask over what. And uh, you can, uh, what else can you do here? There are, there are more equivalent ways of looking at this, uh, at this problem. Well, there is, uh, you can ask. This describes a linear space, right? This thing describes a linear space of matrices, right? This space, you know, there are, there are linear functions here with some coefficients. So this L, L can be written as a sum of xi, ai, where these guys live in M and of F. So these are just constant matrices, and I'm just expressing the, this linear pencil, it's called, right? as a sum of you know, weighted sum with variables of this. Uh, what? No, no, not monomials. It's, these are linear functions. Linear functions. Yeah. Linear functions. So what this is asking is, uh, does there exist a non-singular singular matrix? constant matrix with some alpha i a i, or alpha i is in the field. Right? It's the same question still. Just can, can you instantiate a non-singular matrix? It's again equivalent. But of course, it doesn't make any sense here. I mean, it's, would not, the non-commutativity will not show up. So it's not clear how to, you know, how to generalize it, and that's what, you know, maybe we'll get to at the end of the talk. So let me, inst instead of waiting to the end of the talk, let me make sure I state some result, and then we'll see what we get to. So it turns out that this question 
is so the the right form of this question uh, brings this uh, all these fields into play. It is when you ask it, uh, and I'll, I'll give you one formulation in a second. When you ask it, uh, it becomes the the world problem problem for uh, for skew fields. I'll say what they are. So these guys ask it in non-commutative algebra. It becomes a question of what is the, you know, whether these matrices uh, are in the null cone of some group action of the left-right group action. It's a question in algebraic geometry that actually was independently asked because of GCT. It was asked in algebraic geometry uh, for their reasons, and then it came up again in uh, the program of Marmalis program. Uh, and in quant the statement is that, this, that, this, uh, that the right way to formulate the problems on the, on the left there is a, uh, corresponding this to, okay. Right? Yeah, there is a way to formulate it, which I'll give you one in a second, which is equivalent to these questions from different fields. Okay. okay? So these are equivalent. Equivalent to asking in quantum information theory whether a given um, completely positive positive quantum operator operator uh, is what's called rank decreasing. Okay. And uh, let me give you uh, one formulation of this problem that will turn out to be equivalent to all of these, and uh, it is sort of strange because the, the place it arose first, uh, even before Edmonds. So Edmonds was maybe the first to ask this question explicitly as an algorithmic question, but people studied it beforehand. I know, if, well, I can tell you references. Uh, when people try to ask this question, the commutative one, so people are interested, not just us, people are interested in this PIT question. In linear algebra and uh, matroid theory and some in algebraic geometry, they are interested in this question, the commutative, not just the non-commutative one. And there, they formulated one uh, a sufficient condition for this space to be singular, for the determinant to be zero. Okay, what is this? this is called uh, L as a, as a space of matrices has a shrunk, shrunk subspace. What does it mean? This is, I think that probably Edmonds was aware of this. This is the analog of the whole condition of whole, in whole theorem for bipartite matching. That's what happens when you lift it to this symbolic uh, matrix world, it says that, so L is a strong subspace, if there exist subspaces, let's say W and U, and dimension W is smaller than dimension of U, and all the matrices AI shrink U to W, so, and it says that for all I, AI W, AI U, the fact that the determinant equals zero is equivalent to that? No. Non zero? No. No, this implies this. But not if and only if. It's not true. Actually, let me give you an example. What are you saying? That if it has a shrunk subspace? Yeah, so this implies, so L has a shrunk subspace is this definition, and it implies that the determinant is zero. Yeah. Yeah, but not the other way. It's not if and only if. There is no duality theorem here. There is no duality theorem, and in fact, I'll give you an example when there is no duality theorem. If you want to see such a linear matrix, it's a very familiar one. Look at this matrix, skew symmetric matrix, x minus x, y minus y, d minus d. This matrix has, is, is not full rank over commutative variables, and it is full rank 
here. In fact, if I replace the z's with ones, it's very easy to see because the determinant of this is x y minus y x. Okay, but it has no Schrank subspace, so to see that it it is full rank in the non-commutative world is a hard question, and this is what we are after: checking this condition. Checking this condition is equivalent to all these conditions that people were interested in. Now, let me tell you, it's not obvious that this is decidable. This is in BPP. It took years to figure out that this is decidable. And the result with the Ankit and uh, Raphael is uh, There's a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for this problem. Okay. There's a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for this problem over C. So if you give me integer matrices or rational matrices, so look at the input, there is a polynomial time algorithm in the, the input is these matrices. There's a polynomial time algorithm in the size of the matrices and the size of the entries that uh, tells you whether it's full, no, that's full non-commutative rank. What if the input is L? Does it make sense to us this? Yeah. L, L is, yeah, the input is L, so it's, I give you a basis for it. Yeah, that's right. I give you a basis for L, I ask whether it. So there's a polynomial time algorithm. Now, this polynomial time algorithm is actually due to <coughs> Gurwitz. He just didn't, couldn't analyze it. So he analyzed it in some special case, and uh, what, what we do is uh, basically give a full analysis. And uh, yeah, and the, the main thing I think he was missing, he came from this point of view, the main thing he was missing is some connection to this world. So let me tell you, let's see, so I have 15 minutes, what can I tell you? Uh, <laughs> I think I can tell you some of the uh, definitions that come here. Uh, but I, I want to, I, I, I talked about uh, some slaughtering cows, one, uh, any questions so far? So at least it's clear what uh, yeah, the what statement of the... No, I mean, I don't know, is it, it's not an, an expression in English. I mean, things that everybody... Be, oh, which, which cow? Yeah, which cow? There are several. Yeah, so there are several I was thinking about, and one is uh, yeah, that... In the non-commutative world, so there's a lot of uh, work in the non-commutative uh, on non-commutative arithmetic circuits uh, that I'm not going to have time to survey. But in this world, almost always the determinant you use is a Cayley determinant. As a is a Cayley determinant. So let me write down the. So let me just talk a little bit about this world before uh, moving into the. Here's the determinant some of all permutations. Uh, let's call it well. Doesn't matter. Um, call it X, a matrix of variables. Oh. Y1, sigma of 1, Y, and... We think of it normally as a, a commutative polynomial, but you can think of it as a non-commutative polynomial, of course, then you have to specify the order, and you can say, well, this is my order. Okay, this is my ordering of monomials. And uh, this is called the Cayley determinant. There are many other determinants for the non-commutative world. People thought about it. They had reasons to think about it. There are quantum determinants, there are uh, various Pascal determinants, and so on. And uh, people studied them, but most of the complexity results are about this determinant. And uh, let me mention just a couple, uh, not just about this one, but so the most uh, or the motivating question uh, for me in the past few years uh, was the problem of proving non-commutative low bounds for circuits. Norm Nissan, 30 years ago, proved that both uh, the Cayley 
or another KD, uh, determinant and permanent require exponential size non-commutative formulas. And let's talk about the question of circuits. He's also separated the exponentially um, formulas and circuits. And uh, to date, we have no circuit lower bound. So this is the main motivating. Now, uh, in a paper with uh, Hubesh and Yodayov, we we were studying uh, non-commutative circuits and had some approach, but in particular, we gave just an analog of valiance uh, results for completeness, so showing that Cayley permanent is complete for the non-commutative analog of VNP, and the terminant is com uh, complete for the analog of uh, VP, for the non-commutative analog of VP. So these are completeness, but, you know, we used Cayley determinant for... Uh, uh, for somehow non-commutative VP, which doesn't make sense because we could, unlike, so unlike in the commutative world, we don't know how, we don't have an algorithm for Cayley uh, determinant. We don't have it. So it's not a completeness result, it's just a hardness result. And this was uh, frustrating. This, uh, you can make sense of completeness here, but I won't go into this. This question of Cayley uh, uh, determinant came up in a completely different place in the algorithmic side. Uh, uh, Chen and uh, Sinclair have a beautiful uh, algorithm to try and approximate the permanent of non-negative matrices. Some people are familiar with it. It involves computing the Cayley determinant of some matrices. And we couldn't do this. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to have a Cayley uh, determinant here. And uh, eventually, Shrikant and his advisor Arvin explained it to us. You know, in the non-commutative world, you shouldn't. This is a bad idea to think about Cayley determinant. Cayley determinant and Cayley permanent are the same thing in the non-commutative world. So this is not the right notion of determinant. It shouldn't be taken, you know, we shouldn't take determinant of matrices like this in the, uh, the non-commutative world. And the question is, what should you do? And the answer is, actually, this is, uh, again, something that uh, mathematicians thought about. And uh, the answer is, well, what should be the answer? What are determinants good for? They are good for solving systems of linear equations. Right. They are the cornerstone of linear algebra because, you know, they encapsulate matrix inverse. So in the non-commutative case, you have to study matrix inverse. So just try to invert this. And once you start thinking about it, you start wondering, inverting where? Okay. So uh, Pavel Hubesh and I uh, started investigating circuits with division, <coughs> inverting a matrix has to involve division. <laughs> circuits with division, but non-commutative circuits. Mm -hmm. Have to involve non uh, circuits with division, and so once we slaughtered here the cow, the cow of uh, Cayley determinant and moved to matrix inverse, we have to slaughter uh, another cow, which is in the arithmetic complexity world, you know, division can be eliminated. Strassen taught us this many, many years ago. Well, in the non-commutative setting, we don't know that. We don't know that, and it connects to some of these questions. So we studied here in this paper when uh, division can be eliminated, and we got to, we get basically got to this question. Basically got to this question. So let me talk a, a little bit about these uh, uh, definitions of this uh, problem a bit more formally. I, I will, you know, the yeah. Space, space. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it arises naturally. So let me tell you somehow where or how. Uh, so here,
What do you need to do? You need to understand what does it mean to take inverses in the non-commutative world. So you have to, you can, you can look at the, you know, let's say formulas, expressions, like we use in the commutative world. You can uh, uh, look at x plus y, you know, uh, times z, and then you can take inverse, and so on. Right? You are allowed to have in division also. Right? So just look at expressions like this, and. These are these expressions. They fill up the uh, what's called the localization of uh, the non-commutative algebra. Namely, they are just the objects that you would like to have when you are having division uh, over your non-commutative variables. And the question is whether it's a field. How to define this field? And you know, there are, there are very basic questions. And the person who first defined what it means to have a field, a non-commutative field, so take the algebra of non-commutative elements, non-commutative polynomials, and close them under inverse, and he defined it. And he said, well, you know, these are, these are rational expressions. In fact, let me tell you a nice rational expression. Uh, rational expression. What is peculiar about this rational expression is that it has nested inverses, right? Take an inverse, then you take another inverse. In the commutative field, you can eliminate this. I mean, every object in the you know, rational field of rational function is a ratio of two polynomials, always. Is it true here or not? Well, it, actually, this here it is. Uh, <laughs> turns out that this is x inverse plus x minus y. This is called Wad's identity, very important, the fundamental theorem of uh, projective geometry. But uh, if I wrote here x plus, let's say, y is the inverse w, inverse, then it cannot be simplified. And in fact, uh, there is a general theorem of Wettenauer. Saying that inverse height can be arbitrary. That's actually the connection to formal language theory. It's related to those of us who remember Kleene and Schutzenberger. It's related to star height in formal language theory. OK, so it's really a complicated thing, this uh, non-commutative formula. So how do you know whether two are equivalent, whether one is 0? Uh, the person who defined that, so somehow I have to move these things there. Did not get there. I'll tell you just a bit more about this. Uh, Amitsu in the 40s and 50s defined this, uh, this field, I mean, this field. And he said that in order to know whether two rational expressions like this is some R and this is T, to know whether they are the same, I mean, you do something very natural. You evaluate them on matrices. Just evaluate them on matrices. So there are expressions in many variables, you know. So R is equivalent to, to S, two rational expressions, if R of, you know, vector of matrices is the same as S vector of matrices. Well, these are, of course, tuples of matrices of all sizes. And you have to be careful because there are inversions, and some matrices may not be inversions. So what you want this to hold is whenever the two expressions are defined. OK, so this is the definition of the what's called the free skew field. And, but still leaves the question, this word problem, are two expressions the same? Right. It's a, so I, I'm just reminding you what's a word problem in general in, in, uh, in mathematics. You have mathematical objects. You have ma each object has many representations. And you ask whether two representations are the same objects. This is what polynomial identity testing is. Right. So in the free field, this is a question that was open. And it turns out to be, I'm cheating a bit, is a 
I could define it more precisely. This is this problem that is being solved here. Uh, okay, so let me tell you quickly what are the, the two formulations in this world. Are. And they turn out to be very relevant to solving. So is there like a natural BPP algorithm here, like Schwarzschild? zippel No, but although maybe I should mention since you asked, Maybe you want to ask me <laughs> in the question period. Uh, this is a, it's, a, it's a great question. So forget rational expressions. Talk about non-commutative polynomials. You know, polynomials, non-commutative polynomials is a more basic question. Now, some people are aware that there are non-commutative identity tests like uh, uh, Rasen Spielka and uh, others, uh, which are very important, but they are white box. Of course, there are also some black box results which I won't get into. But suppose you want something like Schwartz Zippel. This problem was for polynomials, so if R and S are polynomials, this was solved in, the, in 1950. 1950. Solved. A BPP algorithm, Amitsur Levitsky. How did they solve it? They said that if you want to test that, so here there is no bound. If I want to know whether these guys are non not equivalent, it would be nice if I knew that if these are expressions of size n, I have to go to matrices of size. I don't know, n squared, 2 to the n, something. It's not clear which finite bound there is here. That's why I said it's not clear that it's decidable. Uh, but for polynomials, they proved that for n by n matrices, sorry. If there are polynomials of degree degree at most d, then the um, dimension of z uh, might as well be at most d over 2 plus 1. It should not go higher than this. So small matrices are fine. Of course, you plug random ones, and it works for polynomials. For this, we don't know. So that's a, a very good question. So let me. I have more questions. So why if you plug random ones works? What? Random what? You said you just plug random matrices. Matrices, yeah. Well, if you pl plug random scalars, a polynomial like this, which is not zero, will be zero for all scalars, right? So it cannot. I mean, in non-commutative polynomials, there may be, it may be identically zero for matrices up to a certain size, but not higher. If you plug in matrices, it becomes a commutative polynomial. Yeah. Well, then when you plug matrices, it becomes a commutative. You can use schwarz zippel and yeah. So let me just very quickly tell you the formulations from these these two worlds. Uh, this will be the easier. And uh, so, what is a? Sorry, I'm switching context. Uh, there are lots of contexts here. What is a completely positive operator? It's like a generalized measurement. It's a tuple of matrices, just like that. And it's an operator on the, on the space of matrices. So it, this thing takes x to this sum, ai x. AI dagger. Takes matrices to matrices, it's particularly interested for, interesting for them where the x's are positive semi definite. In fact, of trace one, they are density matrices. But you can define it uh, like that. And the question is so it's pretty well understood when these operators increase entropy. And the question is where, where you want them not to decrease the rank. So you want that it will not happen, so XPSD. You, you ask yourself, this matrix has decreased rank. rank if there is some matrix X such that, so let's call it, yeah, or, or, let me just say it. Um, this is the operator L. We called it L. If uh, rank L of X is less than rank. This is not good. 
and you want to know whether it happens or not, this is equivalent to our question. So, just to quantify as you know, this is for that there exists an X? Yeah. There it was that for every... No, it's also there. There, there exists these two subspaces, U and W. This connection actually is not hard to, to see. Um, that this shrunk subspace is the same as this. It's not hard to see. It's a projector on the subspace, basically. I should say, what, what is hard to see, the connection of this to all of them, I forgot to mention in the, in the non-commutative world, the person that did most of these connections is Kohn, who gave an alternative description of the Frisco field. And in particular, proved valiant's completeness for the terminant long before valiant. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so there is a question in quantum theory which is equivalent to our question. I will, uh, yeah, I, uh, I have to finish. Or I can uh, take a few minutes just to uh, tell you what this, uh, or you can ask me. I, I think I have to finish. So just to be polite, let me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, what? Which? I don't know this field. <laughs> so in the algebraic, I should say invariant theory. So there was this whole semester here devoted to these connections of arithmetic complexity and uh, invariant theory, algebraic geometry, representation theory. And very briefly, what these guys study, let me do it here and then it will be bigger and clearer. They study group actions. So they study groups acting on vector spaces. So G acts on vector spaces. So acts on vectors. And when you have an action, so this V, you can, you can always think of it as some F to the N. Uh, when you have this uh, action, you can think of uh, G also acting on polynomials. just acts on the coordinates, linear transformations on the coordinates, so you have an action on polynomials. And the question is, what are the invariant polynomials? So invariant, so uh, this f of x, g, are those invariant polynomials? So p, uh, such that well, invariant under the action. Oh, just an example that you are all familiar with. If G is a symmetric group, which are the invariant polynomials? Symmetric polynomials, right? So these are the so these are symmetric polynomials. And uh, it turns out that uh, very base, two very basic uh, uh, actions that are studied in algebraic geometry and also in uh, in GCT are the actions of matrix groups on tuples of matrices. And this goes back to the 19th century. One is simultaneous. So in both cases, we have so SLN or SLN squared. So, so just the um, uh, invertible matrices of determinant one. How do matrices like this, like a matrix B, act on a tuple A1 up to AN? It sends it to B A one B inverse, so just simultaneous conjugation. So this is a f that's one group action, and here the same way. Okay, so these groups of invertible matrices act on top of matrices by simultaneous conjugation. Here, pairs of matrices act by left multiplying from the left and from the right. In all of them, you are trying to understand what are the invariant polynomials. But these are infinitely many. So what you want to know is you know, a finite basis for this. The fact that there is a finite basis is a non-trivial fact. That's Hilbert's uh, theorem. There is always a finite generating set of the invariants here. And you are trying to you know, characterize them, say what their degrees are, and so on. Uh, this is extremely well understood. This is 
relatively recently very well understood and also led to some work uh, connecting to the randomization. Those who know the Forbes Spilka uh, paper answering normalist question, uh, we understand this even better than the algebraic geometers dreamed of. And finally, this action, why is it relevant to us? It's relevant to us because if I give you a couple of matrices and I ask whether they have a shrunk subspace or in any of the other formulation, formulations of this question, it's clear that this question is invariant under the left-right action, right? If I change basis from the left and from the right, this question remains the same. It has full non-commutative rank. If it has full non-commutative rank, when I change these matrices by left and right action. So, uh, this question becomes... I don't get this. Why can't we see that? How can I don't we... see that. I mean, it will matter whether which side you put the u on. Yeah. Ai times u or u times. Yeah, so it will just change what this. Uh, the, the question is whether the, they are invertible matrices. So, the question is whether there exists these two subspaces. They will exist. You just change this basis with b and c. As long as you use the same b on all the ais and the same c on the right side on all the ais. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I didn't understand your question. It's, it's uh, okay. This question is invariant under this action, and in particular, whether a couple of matrices, uh, you know, has has this property, turns out to be the same question as asking whether a couple of matrices satisfies is a common zero of all invariant polynomials. This is a null cone of uh, of this action. So whether it satisfies all the invariant polynomials here. So that's another, uh, another uh, way to ask this question. And uh, people here studied bounds on the size of, on the degree of the basis for these invariant polynomials. These sizes are exactly the size, well, maybe I should. Well, the invariant polynomials here are simply all polynomials of the form. Why should I write it? All polynomials of the form, <coughs> the terminant of the sum of x prime. In other words, plugging matrices, plugging large, large matrices into the non-commutative variables that we have. And the question is how large matrices you need to plug so that you will recognize that something like this happens. So in some sense, it's a reduction of the Non of the um, non-commutative question to the commutative question in a much larger space. The question is how large should you go? It turns out that the best bounds are exponential. And despite the fact that they are exponential and this, what happened for polynomials doesn't happen for rational functions, you know, there is an analysis you can do and use this result, this exponential bound, to get a polynomial time algorithm. So now I'll really stop, and uh, you can ask me even more questions. I, I know it was very impressionistic, this talk, but that's what it is. Um, I didn't quite get the bottom line. So you have the, the one problem above that's definitely in P. Which, which, this problem, problem this problem, that, that yeah. Problem, you yeah. Say it's in P. yeah. Then the three below, I wasn't here. Are you showing that that's equivalent to that problem, and so they're all in P? It was. They're just equivalent to each other. They are all equivalent. Sorry, Russell, thank you. They are all equivalent. These equivalences were known. Okay. Were known. Many due to, the non-trivial ones are due to con, and some are easy that uh, other people figured out. And they are also in P. Okay. Yeah. And then, do you get a non-commutative lower bound from this? Yeah, I wish. So, there is a very, Obvious. We, in fact, we thought we uh, we know it, right? You just apply Cabanas in Pagliazzo. Why not? I mean, the self-reducibility works, right? So, what I didn't mention is that uh, matrix inverse, unlike Cayley determinant, has small non-commutative circuits. This is something that I, I should have said. Right, so why is, why is it good for completeness using matrix inverse as opposed to Cayley determinant? Matrix inverse, 
in the non-commutative in non-commutative algebra has a simple circuit. You just you know, all you have to do is do it for two by two matrices and then recurse. So because they are good, they are small non-commutative matrices for matrix inverse, and we can test this. We can really test whenever we are inverting a matrix that it has an inverse. We can apply our result and get a lower bound, which is not conditional, because we have a deterministic PIT. This is great, only that this is a non-commutative circuit, and we don't know. Um, how do I say it? You don't get the lower bound for the same problem? We don't get the lower bound for the same problem. We need to ask the question about matrices as opposed to scalars. So we can we can apply uh, what you would like to do is uh, like in your case you eventually apply your arithmetic circuits to boolean matrices right to integer matrices. You would like to apply the non-commutative circuit to integer matrices and they may it may be identically zero on all integer matrices or on constant scalars uh, matrices. So you cannot yeah it just doesn't work. So this is this chasing low bound we didn't catch it yet. <laughs> Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, in the non-commutative case, the scalar determinant is equivalent to the scalar permanent. Could you say a little bit more uh, what this means? Yeah, so there are, there are several results. Uh, the first result of uh, Arvin and Srinivasan was in the context of uh, uh, arithmetic branch, non-commutative arithmetic branching programs. They, saw, they showed that if you have a non-commutative arithmetic branching program for k determinants, you can build from it a slightly larger non-commutative arithmetic branching program for k permanent. So in other words, solving it non-commutatively for determinants, you can do it. And then in a later paper with Chin and Sinclair, they actually characterized much better, you know, even over which algebras they are equivalent. Even over quaternions, it's right, it's even yeah. over, over quaternions, they are, they are the same. So it's really well understood. In the uncommutative world, determinant is as hard as permanent. But quaternions was done by Blazer. Actually, it? yeah. Uh, Is it coming again? <laughs> <laughs>